Hello, this is video lecture number 89. Today we are talking about gender, sex, and family in the era of containment. Our subsections are the baby boom, women, work, and family, sex and the middle class, and finally youth culture. In the post-war era, uh, prosperity reshaped American society. The baby boom, that is the sharp increase in the country's birth rate following World War II, was probably one of the most important developments of this period and one with long-term ramifications. Uh, how best to raise this new generation became an urgent question uh, and many turned to Dr. Benjamin Spock's timely manual for guidance. Uh, the nature of the American workforce had also changed significantly. <clears throat> More women worked after World War II than before, uh, though they made less than their male counterparts and were concentrated in certain professions and occupations while largely absent from others. So let's have a closer look then um, at gender, sex, and family in the era of containment with our first subsection, the baby boom. <clears throat> the baby boom era increased the size of American families. Two things were noteworthy about American families after World War II. First, uh, marriages were remarkably stable. Not until the mid-1960s did the divorce rate begin to rise sharply. Second, married couples were intent on having babies. After a century and a half of decline, the birth rate shot up. More babies were born between 1948 and 1953 than were born in the previous 30 years. The baby boom had a vast impact on American society. All those babies fueled the economy as families bought food, diapers, toys, and clothing for their expanding families. The nation's educational system also got a boost. The new middle class, America's first college-educated generation, placed a high value on education. Suburban parents approved 90% of proposed school bond issues during the 1950s. Now, to keep all those baby boom children healthy and happy, middle-class parents increasingly relied on the advice of experts. Dr. Benjamin Spock's best-selling Baby and Child Care uh, sold a million copies a year after its production in 1946. Spock ur urged mothers to abandon the rigid feeding and baby care schedules of an earlier generation. So let's have a closer look then at women, work, and family. Parents of baby boomers were expected to adhere to rigid gender roles as a way of maintaining the family and social order. Men were expected to conform to an ideal that emphasized their role as responsible breadwinners, while women were advised that their proper place was in the home. Endorsing what Betty uh, Frieden called the feminine mystique, the ideal that the highest value and the only commitment for women is the fulfillment of their own femininity, uh, psychologists pronounced motherhood uh, the only, quote, normal female sex role and berated mothers who worked outside the home. Many working class women embraced their new role as housewives then. Uh, in reality, they were increasingly seeking work outside of the home. In 1954, married women made up half of all women workers. By 1960, the number of mothers who worked had increased four times. That same year, 30% of wives worked, and by 1970, it was 40%. Women's earnings lifted families into the middle class during the 1950s and 1960s. Women justified their jobs as an extension of their family responsibilities, enabling their families to enjoy more of the fruits of consumer culture. Now, working women still bore full responsibility for childcare and household management, allowing families and society to avoid uh, facing the social implications of women's new roles, uh, departing significantly from the cultural stereotypes. Okay, our next section is sex and the middle class. In many ways, the two decades between 1945 and 1965 were a period of sexual conservatism uh, that reflected the values of domesticity. Both men and women were expected to channel their sexual desire strictly toward marriage. 
Scientific Studies by Alfred Kinsey, a zoologist at Indiana University in the late 1940s and early 1950s, revealed a broader range of actual sexual behaviors among average American people. A sexual revolution had already begun to transform American society by the early 1950s. Kinsey revealed that homosexuality was far more prevalent in American society than contemporaries assumed. Uh, the beginnings of a politicized gay subculture emerged from the activities of gays and lesbians who wanted to actively change and challenge homophobia in their American society. Uh, their actions laid the groundwork for the gay rights movement of the 1970s. Okay, let's go to our last section then, youth culture. The emergence of a mass youth culture had its roots in the lengthening years of education and the increasing purchasing power of teenagers, a process at work since the 1920s. America's youth were eager to escape suburban conformity, and they began a distinct new market that advertisers eagerly exploited, uh, particularly through the motion picture industry uh, and successful films such as The Wild One from 1951. What really defined this generation's youth culture, though, was its music. The rock and roll that teens were attracted to in the 1950s was seen by white adults as an invitation to race mixing, sexual promiscuity, and juvenile delinquency. Post-war artists, musicians, and writers expressed their alienation from mainstream society through intensely personal, uh, introspective art forms. A similar trend developed in jazz, as black musicians originated a hard-driving improvisational style known as bebop. The Beats were a group of writers and poets then, uh, such as Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, uh, who were both literary innovators and outspoken social critics of middle-class conformity, uh, corporate capitalism, and suburban materialism. They inspired a new generation of rebels in the 1960s. Okay, so that concludes our video lecture for today. At this time, go ahead and answer your review questions and continue with your notes and your work.